All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Donahue. I'm the education curator at the Wingate Museum of Art at Hendricks College. While we are hosting this program virtually, we want to acknowledge that the Wingate Museum of Art occupies the traditional homelands of the Osage, Quapaw, and Caddo. We offer respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who have cared for the land over generations. We ask that you please keep your microphone muted to avoid distraction or disruption. If you have any questions during the program, go ahead and type them into the chat box and Leo will address them at the end. This evening's lecture with Leo Mazo accompanies the exhibition, Altarpieces and Icons, Ray Allen Parker, which is on view in the Biggs and Neely galleries through March 12th. Please visit the museum's website at wingatemuseum.org where you'll find information about all of our spring exhibitions, planning a visit to the museum and other virtual programs. Leo Mazo has been the Louise B. and J. Harwood Cochran Curator of American Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts since June 2016. He was previously an art history professor at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. He is the author of Thomas Hart Benton and the American Sound and contributing editor of Picturing the Banjo. Mazo has held a Paul Mellon Senior Visiting Fellowship at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts at the National Gallery of Art, where he began his book project, Edward Hopper and the American Hotel, which was also a VMFA exhibition, 2019 to 2020. He is presently organizing the exhibition and book, The Art of the American Guitar, which will be on display at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts and travel to the Frist Museum of Art and an additional venue in 2022-2023. Leo, welcome and thank you for being with us. Well, uh, Sarah, thanks so much for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? No? Ray, can you hear me? I can't hear, hear you, but that's, but that's all good. That's all cool. Um, okay, so I'm going to speak, I'm going to try to speak for exactly 40 minutes. So the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen and do this and we'll get going. Yeah, so here we go. 8.05, I'll try to not go past 8.45. Thank you so very much, Sarah, and thank you and Mary Kennedy and your colleagues for organizing this outstanding exhibition, which I wish I could somehow visit. Thank you, uh, Ray Allen Parker and Mary for inviting me to write for the catalog and to give a lecture today. Let's do this. Here we go. I'm so pleased for both the Wingate Museum and of course, Ray, that altarpieces and icons, you know, pandemic, panchmemic, you know, it just happens, but it's the first exhibition to be mounted by the, mu the museum. Building an institution, mounting an exhibition, producing a catalog and so on can be quite challenging, but to gauge by this inaugural project, the Wingate Museum at Hendrix is off to a strong and auspicious start. So congratulations. I think I need to put my cards up front here uh, and state that although, although, let me get my phone back on here, although um, I hope to bring some serious art historical focus to the discussion of the exhibition on display and Parker's work in general, I do have personal connections here. I first met Ray and Mary Jean Parker around 2013 when they began auditing classes at the University of Ar Arkansas uh, in 19th and 20th century American art. I was an associate professor of art history there from 2010 through 2016. They were what you might call tough customers. Don't, don't get me wrong, they were kind and affable, but based on the probing outside the questions, 
they asked, I sometimes felt like they knew the material better than I did, and they probably did. They were what every professor hopes for, though. They did the reading, they participated in class, uh, they looked at art critically, they, they sought to reconcile artworks within strains of cultural history. Uh, but they also brought a measure of honest, if intense, refreshing curiosity. I was, and to an extent, remain intimidated. Ray and Mary Jean honestly were part of the art scene that I fancied myself a part of. Um, Ray is an artist. He, he knew, he knows all the cool artists. They admired his work, as I do. I, however, was just an art historian, wanting to be a good colleague, a good Razorback, I guess, I don't know, and, and hoping to be part of this cool artist world. Uh, things changed dramatically when in 2014, I was pulling into the university's special exhibitions gallery called La La Land, I think on MLK, and I clipped the side of Ray's beautiful, pristine black SUV, a Nissan Rogue. I made more than a dent, more than a scratch. A little too eager, I misjudged the arc of the turn when I pulled in and parked next to his car. This may seem a little random, but it is really how I got to know Ray. When I found out, when I, sheep, when I sheep, sheepishly approached him and told him what happened, that he, um, um, was that the, what I found out then was that the guy I thought I knew, well, I did not know at all. The stern, tough guy in the hoodie, the shy guy who I interpreted as being not terribly Leo friendly, seeing that I felt terrible, told me not to worry that these things happened, that his car had seen better days anyway. He never even sent me a bill for the repairs. I hope he does it now. As I got to know him, I saw that he was a compassionate intellectual whose scholarly intensity was matched by his kindness, and that all this reflected his commitment to understanding people and himself through his art. Put a different way, what I had seen on the surface, I had completely misjudged. What you, super, what you superficially scan on first glance can be, well, superficial. This is something that Ray knew far better than I did. And this is relevant to Ray as a person and an artist, but it's especially pertinent for the works on display at the Wingate. I have a lot to say about his art, but the connecting glue here is that for all of the painstaking detail of the finely painted surfaces in this exhibition, one of Ray Parker's goals is precisely to go beneath the surface and show us our own humanity within the journeys we take and the institutions we inhabit. Several, several of us on the Zoom this evening may know pieces of Ray's history, but allow me to highlight a few of these. Ray was born in San, San Diego. He was, um, as his presentation the other night stressed, the son of a sailor, a sort of military brat who lived in a number of places before his family settled in Egypt, Arkansas, in the northeast portion of the state, in Craighead County near Jonesboro. Due South depicts his parents within this vast empty landscape, so empty that as of the 2010 census, there are all of 112 people living in the town. As with so many works by, by Ray, it's based on a photograph that his father is toughened up with the addition of a gun and a cigarette in his mouth. Already in this 2014 painting, we see one of the dominant themes in Parker's work, an attempt to locate meaning and feeling, even tenderness, in a world that may, on the outside, seem as tough as the humorless Marlboro man of now forbidden commercials. Ray went to the University of Arkansas, where he majored in English, graduating in 1974. So we can do the math and we can figure out how, how old he is. He went back and got his master's in 1978, specializing in 20th century American literature and contemporary fic fiction. Given his gravitation to writers such as the renowned poet and University of Arkansas professor Jeffrey Davis, depicted here in Poet of Light and Prayer, one could say that his fascination with Pervier's of literature is alive and well in 2021. I've never really spoken to him about this, but given that he would move back to Fayetteville and given that site-specific individuals, neighbors, university students, um, and so on, are the dramatis personae in his work to date, it seems that Fayetteville became then and still remains 
a powerful sense of place for Ray. As an undergraduate, he took only one art class, a painting course with the famous Arkansas artist and so-called Gothic storyteller, uh, Donald Roller Wilson. Reminiscing of this time, in his Zoom presentation the other night, Parker commented that he did well, but that he it took, quote, everything he had emotionally, physically, and then some. Painting, th that is, can be intense and demanding. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think anyone would ever in a million years mistake Parker's work for Roller Wilson's. And it feels blasphemous to even show these two together. But for all that separates them, they do share an interest in layered narrative as conveyed through bold application of paint, and especially through exacting craftsmanship. As regards Parker, Parker's work at left, the most obvious such charge symbolism might be the double meaning of nu nuclear. He's always interested in titles, it seems, which denotes the social unit, the basic unit of the family, in this case his, and the threat of atomic annihilation that was especially prevalent in his youth. English and art? Okay. Well, Ray would soon go to Dallas to work for J.C. Penney, where he would have an illustrious 32-year career in company communications and advertising, officially retiring in 2011. Ray was head of photography for much of his time there. He honed his already strong skills in the medium during this time, and it's little wonder that both works here, that both of the works here are uh, the result of photographs. Each one of the works in, on display at the Wingate Museum started with photographs. In fact, Parker has not worked from a live model since 2016. He recently remarked, quote, painting from a photograph allows me to look through 300 to 500 images to find the person I, I want. Not unlike, not unlike, um, a filmmaker storyboarding a plot or siphoning a single narrative out of many possibilities. And I have observed this firsthand when he photographed and ultimately painting my son, uh, Asa, early in January of 2016. I didn't just observe the painter photographer at work though. The finished painting revealed a side to him that very few people other than his parents and a few friends had seen. In the photographs, Asa effectively opened up to him. He let Ray in, so to speak, even if he maybe didn't think he would do so in the way he did. And I'll have a few, I'll have a bit more to say about this practice in a few minutes. Upon moving from Dallas to Fayetteville, Mary Jean began taking art history courses. Ray and literature courses. Ray took art history and increasingly studio art from various pro professors, including painters Sam Keen, Kirsten, Kristen Mus Musnug, and Stephanie Pierce. Much as they met uh, and befriended fellow Arkansas students, they also got to know selected wait staff and frequent patrons at local camp cafes. And that's important because these individuals would increasingly become the subjects of Ray Parker's painted universe. One such Fayetteville food establishment is our Sega's Deep Depot, where he encountered the figure, then a wa waitress, who appears in Local Server 2, a generic title that might belie the individual's recent adoption of, a, of the non-binary pronoun identification early. The university may have taught him how to paint, but the trips to Arcegas, independent bookstores and the like were part of an ongoing artistic education and immersion into a sociology of group dynamics and individual psychologies. The intensity of the sub subject with her partially shaved head, her numerous tattoos, her and partially missing ring finger bitten off by a dog was intimidating. But in the photo session, he encountered her shyness and sensitivity, maybe even a bit of world wariness. He found in early, as he has stated, a quote, luminous, delicate beauty I wanted to share with, with the world. It was also at our Sega's that he met the figure Sarah Hyatt, then a wait waitress who appears in Saint Sarah. Now, as some might say, hipster conscious as Fayetteville or any artsy city, 
can be. He recognized in Sarah and other Arsega's de denizens a refreshingly modest person, in spite of what Ray came to know as a unique and talented individual. In the studio, she proved when he photographed her, she proved to be unselfconscious, engaging, patient, and really funny, not to mention tolerant and deeply concerned for friends who might be su suffering. She is shown as a saint might appear with no ma makeup, no ex excessive fussing with her hair. Parker depicted the haloed woman with anatomical and physiological naturalism, and it's little surprise that the source for the painting is Caravaggio, St. Matthew and the, the Angel. Various versions of the Caravaggio painting have been criticized for debasing Matthew, making him too vernacular, not granting him enough, enough de decorum. A case can be made though that Saints Matthew and Sarah each know that any such errors are surface at best. The artist's embrace of Arsega's special vibe, great coffee in a warm atmosphere, I just read on the website, and I can attest to that, having spent a lot of time and money there. But that sense is suggested yet further in his painting, Arsega Marriage, in which the larger than life, husband and wife, Jason and Ava Arsega, personnel in the family run business, appear with halos. They hold hands and even lean in slightly towards each other symbolizing marital fidelity and equality. One of the altarpieces in the present exhibition, this work is indeed altarpiece size, measuring a whopping 96 by 72 inches. Parker maintains that, quote, scale and monumentality are the most transformative elements of painting, end quote. He believes that any meaning or drama or sense of spirit we may attribute to this is a function of large scale certainly more than color, more than line or mark, more than subject matter even. The stated source for our Sega marriage um, is Jan van Eyck's 1434 Northern Renaissance, Giovanni Arnolfini and his bride, sometimes called the Arnolfini wedding piece. Measuring only 32 by 24 inches, Van Eyck's painting, one might say, is about as modest size as Parker's is, well, huge. Where the shoes are take, taken off in Van Eyck's painting to denote standing on a holy ground at, at left, Parker has closely observed the intact Adidas sneakers still on Jason's and, Ace's, and Ava's feet. But there are more similarities than differences. They each occupy a relatively shallow, sort of stage-like space. The most important parallel might concern the equal footing of the Arsegas as true partners, I think. Art historians have recently determined that with his hand in hers, the Van Eyck painting at right of two newlyweds function as a legal document, a notice of spousal equity and their, the ability to speak for one another in all matters, what today we would call a sharing of power of attorney. And the Arsega marriage, the tender holding of hands, look at that, uh, joins other signs of companionate marriage analogous to Van Eyck's Arnolfini portrait. Parker joins modernist writers like T.S. Eliot in drawing inspiration and subject matter from food service, service establishment and other modern spectacles of com community. In Eliot's late play, The Elder Statesman, Monica tells her boyfriend Charles, quote, you should have taken me to some other restaurant. The waiters all seem to be your intimate friends, end quote. And in Eliot's canonical poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock from 1915, he mentions the infamous sawdust restaurant early on. Understanding public spheres and commercial exchanges as sites for the, the emphasis on experience within traditional modernism, Parker has effectively updated Eliot's cocktail party and sawdust restaurant with Arsegas, the depot, toast, and so on. The artist met the woman who appears in New Blonde one with an intense green-eyed gaze looking both at us and through us, however, at Woodstone Pizza, also in Fayetteville. Dominating the picture plane, her proximity to us suggests what we call a co-expansive space, a joining of the pictorial world and the viewer's actual world. The model here is Madison Shawhorn, who is in fact a graduate of Hen Hendricks College. 
In her endeavor to give herself a new look, a new visual identity, Schallhorn buzz cut her hair and bleached it blonde. In his entry for this painting, in the catalog for this show, the artist noted that she, quote, altered her appearance to fit the person she hoped to present to the world, end quote. Does a painting like this facilitate this endeavor? I think it does, putting Schallhorn and Parker on something like the same stage. At the very least, it seems that this painting joins the modernist Eliot's lines from Prufrock in its theme of self-fashioning as one wishes. He writes, there will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. T.S. Eliot wasn't kidding around when he found modernism's best fodder in restaurants and ca cafes. This is Sabrina Snell, who also works at Woodstone. She came to the photo session with a rabbit and a rabbit's foot. Parker based the work on Leonardo's Girl with Ermine. Personnel from yet another Northwest Arkansas restaurant appears in Parker's 2021 painting, Restaurateur. This is Molly Mullis, co-owner of Oven and Tap in Bentonville. Okay, so this is not exactly what abstract expressionist painters like Jackson Pollock or Willem de Kooning would have called all over painting, in which the medium is spread all about the canvas with little regard for the edge, never mind foreground, middle ground, background. But Parker has nonetheless painted all over almost the entire canvas. He has positioned the face so it occupies all of the foreground except a portion of the upper right corner. The painting crops out her hair and, and neck lending a close-up snapshot-like sensibility and suggesting that Molly continues beyond the confines of the composition. Neither Pearl nor Restaurateur are in the Wingate exhibition, but they show the artist continuing in the direction of these co-expansive spaces that through various measures implicate and reach us, the viewers. Similar in-your-face compositions by Parker include some guy and MJ, portraits respectively of his son-in-law and wife. Echoing the sensory and emotional emphasis of literary and visual modernism, the artist had hoped for, quote, an expressive image that truly captured her when painting MJ. Not wild about being depicted in the first place, MJ reluctantly posed, Mary Jean. Unlike most of the other works I'm showing you tonight, there is only one photograph, really just a lighting test of both Mary Jean and Guy. Guy's full name is Guy Michael Davis, a ceramicist who, with his wife, who is Parker's daughter, Katie, exhibit together under the collective name Future Re Retrieval. This is an artist collective worth Googling. Trust me on this. What do we say about an artist who enlarges faces but shrinks and abbreviates proper names. Maybe it's the serious artist who is most whimsical. Some guy suggests that the doting father-in-law somehow forgot or chose not to say his name. And of course he di didn't. But these works remind us that even the name itself is merely a surface thing. If whimsy and artsy if whimsy and artsy uh, describe some, some guy, we will need adjectives denoting intensity to characterize Parker's picture of his son, Ben, in post-punk. Ben crosses his arms, looks slightly away from the viewer. He emerges from a dark orange background whose shadows rhyme with the darkened folds of his shirt, which itself depicts silhouettes of the 1980s Swedish punk band Astakask. The title of this, of this Astakask album, Med is I Magen, translates to with ice in the stomach. But intense as the gaze is here, not all is icy and gut-wrenching here. This portrait is the product of a dad who's close enough to his son's world that he knows what the DIY 1980s genre post-punk was in the first place. This is the product of a parent who allows his child, even as a grown up, to retain his identity. And who is Ben any, anyway? Ben is an English professor at Brown whose publication topics range from 
Marxism to Thomas Hardy to Twin Peaks. His gaze at post-punk, however, seems worlds away from music, literature, or any learned knowledge, instead emphasizing the ability of paint to capture the intensity of an experience formed of proximity to the person one depicts and with whom one shares a space. In after, in after Durer, after Tre Tregel, Parker offers up his own countenance to forceful directness and clarity, as he puts it. The family construct, far from being confining, opens up a world of deep-seated personal and intellectual inquiry. In other words, the family in, in general is for P Parker a productive site of modernist investigation. The initial, the title and initials at left refer to contemporary German painter and illustrator, Michael Triegel, and importantly, Northern Renaissance German painter, Albrecht Dürer, and particularly his self-portrait at 28 from 1500, which Triegel riffs on too. The last of Dürer's three self-portraits, this work resembles some versions, painted versions of Christ with the artist raising his uh, hands to his chest as if to make a blessing. Parker, however, folds his, his arms. Dürer was actually strawberry blonde, but he gave himself brown hair here in keeping with the canonical depictions of Christ, salt and pepper Parker performs no such dra drama. More obvious religious allusion um, is present in conceiving of works in the present exhibition at the Wingate as altarpieces, sometimes containing and called retables and usually containing an image of a saint or saints or Christ, the structure would stand tall, large on the rear of an altar so it could be visible from a distance. Altar pieces often contained relics and held tabernacles for communion. One could kneel before a, an, an altar piece, treating it as a ga gateway, a conduit to the divine. To what is Parker's whimsically titled Madonna and Children a conduit though? Well, if the church is one institution capturing Parker's imagination, so is the family in general. Here we have the artist's neighbor, Cindy Mur Murray, and her son and da daughter, who dress themselves for the photo shoot, each choosing camo. Parker was surprised to find her at City Hall one day, where they were both uh, enmeshed in a zoning battle against a uh, zealous local developer. Ray saw how she attended to her children, even as she protested, quote, she appeared to me as a Madonna fi figure, kind, protective, understanding, nurturing all odds and circumstances. Parker repurposes a Christian medium, then, the altarpiece, to denote another sacred institution, the family in general and motherhood in particular. These altarpieces then blur time-honored understandings of sacred versus secular realms. A myriad of formal choices and compositional strategies come into play. The Madonna and children seemingly reaches us as if coming out of its fictive two-dimensional zone and into our real 3D space. And you can see in the de detail from early on in the work, the daughter's footsteps are just slightly over the border of the altarpiece wings. Look at all three figures feed in the final product and look at how the mother and the son's heads oversteps the border too. Coming out in relief from their respective amorphous inky black niches. In this way, they seem to challenge the flatness of the picture plane. This might count in a sense as an example of so-called trompe l'oeil or fool the eye pa painting. Similar trompe l'oeil painting is uh, dynamics are famously at work in Charles Wilson Peale's 1795 Staircase Group. Uh, within the political and social context of the early Republic, Peale's painting presented its many early spectators with a public test of visual discernment, real or not real, a persistent and definitely false myth held that George Washington in fact was so fooled as he walked past this in May of 1795 that he stopped and docked his hat to it. It challenges the eye illusionistically as it illusionistically suggests a stairwell coiling backwards into the picture plane. 
or dared to pick up the foreshortened playing card on the next to bottom stair, and Peel's attention to connect our world with the painted world is honored in the work's installation at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where the first wooden step, of course, extends outside the painting. Parker's painting, I believe, takes similar steps to bridge the gap between painted art and here and now life. Whatever Madonna and Children games, gains from its religious allusions of the triptych format and the title, pluralizing Madonna and Child, it seals the deal with the painstaking verisimilitude, lifelike, lifelikeness. With feet stepping forward, the group challenges the primacy of flatness that we attribute to two-dimensional works. Parker's Eke Fem Femina, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing, is an equally ambitious experimentation with the limits and possibilities of the altarpiece for format. Also a triptych or three-piece altarpiece, the work depicts the artist and Ray's friend, Hannah McBroom, emerging from niches formed of partly cloudy skies. The Latin inscriptions at lower left and, and right translate to identity and body. Words which carry a few different meanings in this case. On the one hand, the very talented painter McBroom and Parker are both fig figurative painters and use all the tools of the trade to probe their sitter's identities. When he met McBroom, McBroom she was entering her third grueling year of transitioning into womanhood. This has been, as one might imagine, a grueling physical, psychological, and pharmaceutical journey. Telling us a bit about the subject, the Latin banner translates to, behold the woman from Arkansas and Mississippi. With its title, a pun on the famous painting Eke Homo by Titian, this work is a veritable art history lesson. The triptych scale and format relate to Northern Renaissance painter Roger van der Weyden's Seven Sacraments, obviously depicting as vignettes, the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church. There's a similarity in the text laden banners in each. In the center panel, Parker place replaces Rogier's heraldic emblems with Hannah McBroom's H&M initials. Parker was also inspired by Velazquez's resplendent Christ on the cross. He seeks to evoke Hannah's strength, beauty, and yearning, frankly, for acceptance. With this in mind, her outstretched hands recall for the artist Christ's suffering and outreach for love and understanding. Parker is also inspired here by Van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. In traditional art history iconography, red roses can symbolize beauty in Christ's blood, but I find the expressive use of red also very reminiscent of this early Van Eyck painting, a very use, early use of oil painting, and one of the first modern self-portraits. Some may find in the crook of Hannah's neck a distant cousin of traditional means of representing Mary in late, the Virgin Mary in late medieval and early Renaissance art. Time. So Parker had previously depicted McBroom in 2019 in the painting Trans She Her, a title he took directly from her Instagram account. In his comments for the exhibition catalog, the artist writes that he sought to show McBroom's self-assurance, a degree of confidence he reads into her embrace, starting with these three words. In comparison to the altarpiece I just showed you, the paint handling here is a little more loosely applied. Parker even says it's purposefully sloppy. Be that as it may, the bold painterly passages, I think, enliven Hannah's countenance, suggesting a pensive snapshot in the life of a vibrant, caring, feeling being. Parker's Innocent from 2020 depicts the University of Arkansas printmaking professor, Brianne Trammell, with her corgi, Riggins. The dog was actually sick in the photo session and died a few weeks later. So grouping Brianne, Brianne and corgi on the chairs Parker was emphasizing this extraordinary friendship between dog and human and sought to memorialize it in a manner that caused attention to the lost friend that Brienne, the close friend that Brienne lost. Each is given a seat in the regal chair. Riggins looks to his friend, Brienne, who in turn looks directly at the viewer, transferring that sense of uncertainty 
and sanctity of memory our way. Not only denoting the, loyal, the loyalty of her canine companion, innocent also refers to one of the foundations of the work. Diego Velazquez's portrait of Pope Innocent X from about 1650. As with Eke Femina, this piece too is a clinic and art historical allusion. Innocent repeats the impressive red velvet armchair and red background of clothing uh, at right, but replaces the paper in the Pope's hand with a yellow rose, indicating Brienne's former home in te Texas. They are seated on a massive, uh, a massive chairs that Parker had seen first on a visit to the Cincinnati Art Museum. I'm not sure just how he did, did this, but he used for source material for the floor, an image of the tiling found at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And, and you know, and I only know this because Ray told me this obviously, but, but I think he Photoshopped it into the photograph from which he worked. That sounds good. Uh, it seems that in honoring the eternal union of these two friends, Brienne and Riggins, Corgi uh, Parker uh, turned to disparate sources to invest this sacred union with the weight of several time-honored histories. Measuring eight by six feet, this is one big painting. And to be fair, Parker groups innocent among his altarpieces, so it's not as if we were expecting something really small. And it's the same of several works, including the Arsega marriage that we just looked at. But the rich colors with the recurring red helping to unify this composition of eclectic al allusions all seem to make the work emerge in relief or to pop, pop out, you might say. And look at these surfaces. We experience Parker's work through a pronounced physicality, encouraging both touch and the illusion of touch. Corky's fur and the rich velvety upholstery appeal to us, and touch is made literal in Brienne's grasp of the flower stem. This sort of understanding that grounds experience in the tactile realm is often called haptic, as opposed to knowing by way of the eyes, optic. So yes, these are big colorful compositions, some of them wide, some of them tall, perhaps requiring turning our heads 45 degrees in order to take in their lateral immensity. Not unlike sculpture, they often demand that we walk around examining different configurations of their foreground, middle ground, and background from this side and that side. Parker's works often demand such a bo prolonged bodily engagement of these things that seem to ensconce us. What I find most impressive about his works is what he gets from his sub subjects, his models in the first place. I've spoken with him about his approach and I think it comes down to trust, getting someone to open up to you, to let you in. This has been a critical strategy for many of the best known portraits by the most renowned artists. In the depression, Fortune Magazine commissioned photographer Walker Evans and writer James Agee to provide an article on the hardships of Southern tenant farmers. This photo essay covering the inhabited landscape north of Greensboro, Alabama was never printed, but resulted in their 1941 book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Recent scholarship has demonstrated the extent to which both men worked within the world of their subjects who otherwise would have just not, would not have suddenly made themselves available. Surely helping Parker get his models to open up to him, to give him access to their world is the fact that, is the fact that like A.G. and Evans, by frequenting and getting to know the denizens of uni universities, cafes and art galleries, he's acted on the same stages as the characters appearing in his portraits, coexisting, taking classes with the woman depicted in stare, well, that surely helped convince her to pose. But it takes time. This process of how much time it takes is dramatized, stilled, you might say, by Dorothea Lange's suite of photo migrant camp photographs 
produced by the Farm Security Administration, a New Deal agency. The FSA would use works by Lang, Evans, and others as part of an enormous archive documenting socioeconomic conditions throughout the U.S. and serving as proof to a sometimes reticent Congress to demonstrate the need for yet more New Deal funding. But this series of photographs summarizes the approach to her subject, who, you know, was of course breastfeeding her infant as Lang got closer and closer and closer, winding up with the classic photograph that we all know her for. In fact, Lang had just this very powerful and posed image or something like it in mind well in advance of getting this perfect shot. So Parker similarly approaches his subject and his patient and does not mind being told, no, I won't pose for you. The word posing suggests art artifice, but his subjects know that a session with Ray will result in their face and part of their life story, taking on metaphorical and physically large proportions. A lot of trust is at stake. So we start with the premise that not just paintings, but the initial photographs are the results of prolonged interactions with area artists, neighbors, friends, food service workers, and then some. With the artists occupying the same realm as those individuals he seeks to paint, a traditional painter subject di distinction is muddled in some of these works. The, picture, the people pictured contribute to and at some level produce the artworks in which they appear. In understanding the importance of reversing the usual directional flow of authorship, we might recall sociologist Les Back's argument that one does not take photographs so much as the subjects to be pictured give themselves their stories to the photographer. So it's the ethical role of the photographer, we might, of the picture taker, maker, we might reason, to create an atmosphere of respect that is conducive to such giving. If one role, if one goal of photographing individuals is to record their presence, their state of mind, or character at a particular moment, a photographer might well end up listening to and, and, and emphasizing with his or her subject story. The person to be pictured indeed may not feel disposed to open up otherwise. With the, the, with the photographer or painter in Parker's case, when Parker listens to his subject or listening with our eyes, as Back puts it, Parker, any such artist, invariably enables the beholder to do the same, to access a story that otherwise may go unnoticed or underemphasized. But more importantly, I think, he or she allows the subject or model to play a part in the telling of their own story. These images I showed a little earlier do not show Ray actually shooting photos. He's holding a camera, yeah, and we see a tripod, but mostly what we see is Ray Parker talking with Asa Mazo, taking it all in, much as Asa himself was doing. Parker listens with his eyes, but those eyes then go through the camera. Five altarpieces, seven icons, deadpan expressions enlarged, art historical vocabulary mind, Lots of modernism, experiential understandings of food outlets and their denizens, all brought to emotional life. Inhabitants of other institutions like the church or the family, occupying a certain softened heroism. All in two-dimensional works, but so big they demand the physical and direct engagement and voracious gaze we might usually associate with sculpture or large-scale installation. My colleague and friend Ray and I continue to ask qu tough questions of each other. Not tough as in belligerent, just honest probing and always straightforward. Things that probably need to be dis discussed. When we first started talking about this exhibition, I asked them, icons and altarpieces, really? How are you even defining these? And I think I will give him the last word. He replied, why I icons? I think of icons as representing something compelling, undeniable, significant. Picasso, Muhammad Ali, Audrey Hepburn, Einstein, Napoleon. The people in my portraits are to me spellbinding presences whose power, beauty, mystery, and allure I try to understand and present. In this way, the paintings stand in for them. 
just as icons of saints depict them, but also represent them. No doubt an unachievable quest on my part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leo. That was fantastic. I appreciate the insights and observations and personal experiences that you've shared. Um, I invite folks to use the chat to uh, ask questions of Leo. Um, we are also comfortable taking your questions directly. So if you would like to uh, unmute yourselves, if you feel comfortable doing so, you can dogs are welcome too. <laughs> Abby, get over here. And my, my girlfriend, Betsy, just wrote, wrote me, hi, Betsy. And that made Abby go off. Come here. Oh. <laughs> Abby, hop in. Yeah, there's Abby. <laughs> what a good boy. I think Abby's got some questions and comments for us. <laughs> Abby could care less. All he wants is human food. <laughs> Leo, I might start by um, just asking you to, to share a little bit more or reflect a little bit more on the, uh, the size of uh, these, these altar pieces and icons. Um, instead of being imposing, um, they come up, they come across to me as very intimate and the subjects seem uh, very um, accessible and open to me. But I wonder if you could uh, share your reflection on, on the sheer size of them and how, how that compares to some of the other pieces that you shared with us and just your, your thoughts in general about the size of, of these pieces. Well, if I'm going to blame anyone for the large scale and size, and by the way, size and scale are not one and the same, uh, I, I would blame many of, of, of the works that I showed, like Velasquez and, uh, you know, Van Eyck's Man with the Red Turban is pretty small, but, and um, the Arnolfini wedding piece is pretty small, but, you know, the Ghent altar piece is like acreage pr practically. Um, okay, so you didn't hear me say, say that. Anyway, hey, Jody Fouch. Oh, my God. Um, so I, I don't know. You know, this is one of the things that, honestly, I've kind of, I've really harassed Ray since the fall about his use of scale. Um, but I think that there's a long tradition in political thought and, it, and it's particularly seen in the federalist papers where um there's this safety valve argument made for the expanse of the american continent the idea is that americans will be less likely to beat the crap out of each other they will they will have room to work out differences um and because of a large land mass. It's somewhat naive in the Federalist Papers, but I think large paintings in the way they, they ensconce us, you know, they can intimidate us and make us run like hell in the other direction, but they can also cradle us. You know, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Rothko Ch Chapel in my hometown of Houston. And not unlike those works, which are also called murals and are kind of arranged in altar piece fashion, those are very large, you know, one could find them very daunting. It's as dark as purple gets without being black, I think. Um, but not unlike Ray's work, I think that size and scale can be quite consoling and cathartic. It's what you put in the, in the picture plane that determines that, I think. Do you mind if I have a follow up on the size question? Sure. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm right, but I don't think that, I mean, there's obviously plenty of big paintings in the history of art, but I don't think in a lot of big faces, aside from maybe um, some sculptures, I'm thinking of like this early, this Roman sculpture of one of the emperors, you know, really big heads. I don't think there, I don't think there are a lot of big heads until, um, until like Chuck Close and maybe, you know, people like that. And it's kind, it's kind of modern. And I think that's right. But do you think that maybe has something to do with modernism? You're talking about all the ways that Ray relates to modernism, modern themes and things like that. 
you think maybe that you know the size of the face itself might have something to do with that i think it does um i think that in the first place secular portraiture in the history of the world the history of world art is a rel relatively recent thing um, remember that uh 15th century man with a red turban picture of van that we believe is van eyck people consider that to be the self the first self portrait but i think if modernism whatever else modernism is about if modernism is in part about expression and feeling as an ends in itself i think that Ray's work forces the question and I mean part of what could be intimidating or cathartic depending on your point of view in his work uh, is that there's sort of no escaping you know it's a um, the writer Henri Folsillon said that the only part of the human body that's as expressive of the, as the human face is the hands and, um, and Ray does you know, we have some big hands. Look at Eke Fem, Femina, for, for example, the picture of Hannah, uh, and some big faces. So I think you're absolutely right to see the enlarged faces as within a modernist discourse of um, expression as an ends in itself. And, and the expression gets more intense, I think, when you make it larger. Maybe it's like a, like a, you know the idea that that uh, the world becomes more about the individual. You know, individual rights. Just individualism is more and more prominent as time goes on, and maybe that's maybe that's why people are doing such big faces. Hmm. I wonder. I don't. I don't know. I bet Ray, Ray knows. Well, what do you think, Ray? What do you think about you know? Not too many people have, have done big faces, plenty of big figures, but not I've never seen a face that's like that big, I mean, aside from 20th century art. Um, I've, I was introduced to large faces uh, with the work of Chuck Close, but also Lucian Freud. Um, and uh, primarily Jenny Savile. Um, people, um, many people are familiar with Freud's work and sometimes it's very small. Like for instance, his portrait of Queen Elizabeth, which is uh, like eight by eight by eight. It's almost a joke, but uh, some of his pieces are huge and like closes, they focus on, on the faces primarily to, to the exclusion of everything else. And then when I saw Jenny Savile's work, um, she takes that to the very extreme and you start getting these uh, eight, eight, even 10 foot uh, heads. And to me, th that um, brings the face to you uh, in an undeniable way that you really can't run away from. And it introduces you to the, the person in an inescapable way so that they end up uh, confronting you as much as you do them. And hopefully there's some uh, exchange of humanity that happens there. But yeah, um, you're right as far as I know. Um, um, this seems to start with uh, Chuck Close at, at that scale of work. Maybe it's just utterly impossible to paint a painting like you paint without using a photograph because it's just you need the you need the power of the you know the detail in the photograph to get something that big and have it isn't well it interesting though that there's in sculpture there's heroic large sculpture think of starting with con constant constant you know the head That's of, one of yeah yeah i mean it's interesting that there are pre-modern exceptions to this yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good point that uh, photography is needed here. I mentioned that to Leo uh, when we were going through our discussions of this. To get up close and get the detail I, I want, I think would be impossible with a live model. Uh, you have to get so up close and personal to get these uh, large, to, to get these details and realize them as large as, as I do. So um, a mechanical means of doing that is almost a necessity. 
Yeah, I think it has to be. Leo, oh, I'm going to say something real quick. My nickname for my painting is the Grand Canyon because it's, it's so detailed and so many crevices in it. So anyway, it's close. That's it. All right, that's what I'll call it in my final <laughs> one. Leo, we've received a, a question in the chat, or I have. Uh, somebody wants to know, is it truly possible to make new work while working in the confines of a 600-year-old Western tradition? Um, I don't know. It seems like a very rhetorical question. I, I think that... Um, I think that one of the pitfalls of the very term modernism has been the emphasis on that which is new, unique, singular, and exceptional. Um, some people think that modernist work in architecture, mu music, criticism, writing, and so on, uh, overdoes it on that, on that front. Um, and uh, I, I guess for me, new and never been done before is not the same as originality. It, to me, it's what you do with the pieces of the puzzle. Um, people have writ written a lot about, about this. Um, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to, to it. I think that's fair. Other questions or comments from folks? Well, why, you know, you know what? I see a lot of former students of mine. I could call on them. Chris, you never took a class from me. Ray, you did, but it's more like you calling me. Jody Fouch, oh my God. I think I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? You are. You are unmuted. Not, uh, I am not a cat. Hello. Nice to see you all. Hey, I've got a formal question or uh, right. just a process question for Ray, actually. Yeah. A, that uh, Jeffrey Davis painting from 2020 is really soft and beautiful, a little different in style than a lot of your other stuff. And I'm wondering if you're experimenting there, what your intent was, just tell me a little about what you were doing with that. Uh, yeah, it's absolutely an, an experiment and um, a way of fleeing away from these huge altarpieces. Um, I'm physically and mentally weary from painting uh, eight, eight foot, 12 foot uh, figures. And uh, I wanted to get to something more controllable. At the same time, I realized the thing that I enjoyed most about making the altarpieces uh, were the faces themselves. And um, with even given the scale of some of my pieces, the, the faces are relatively small, um, not much larger than you might see in a normal uh, two or three foot portrait. So I wanted to really uh, scale those up so that I could uh, dive into the, the detail of them, the expression of, expression of them, and also enjoy the um, the actual painting of them, the, the, the making of the image. And so in the new series, which I'm calling person to person, I'm, I'm trying to do that. So uh, all those are uh, five feet high, uh, have similar uh, Caravaggio uh, black backgrounds, but uh, I'm also at the same time trying to loosen the mark and play with the paint in a way that uh, blurs the distinction uh, between the paint and the, and the figure. Uh, great lecture, Leo, thank you. Thanks, Ray. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Matthew, are you talking? I can't hear you. Sorry, yeah, I was muted. I had another question for Ray, actually. You studied Ray with, um, with Stephanie Pierce. I did. Who, who's an artist who I really, really love, who I met uh, once. And I'm just curious, what was that like studying with her? Well, uh, have you met Stephanie? 
just just once. Okay. Uh, Stephanie is a a very uh, fiercely committed person to art, uh, very demanding of herself and her talents, but also very demanding of her students. And uh, it's the kind of intense painting experience uh, that I wanted at the time I was taking classes from her. And um, I learned uh, an extraordinarily great amount from her, probably more than all of my other teachers. But um, primarily what I learned, and you may have noticed in, in the, uh, the show that I did is, as you saw my paintings build, was that Stephanie taught me to paint the entire canvas simultaneously. So I'm working all over, over the place. Um, the, the painting the background, the same time I'm painting the figure, uh, painting the top at the same time that I'm painting the bottom. So that um, in the end, the image only comes up uh, finally and, and completely with the, the final stroke of the painting. And uh, what this enabled me to do was a, a couple things. Uh, number one, to make it look like um, it was a complete painting by one person. Uh, you, you know that if you start in one corner of a painting and paint to the bottom of a painting, uh, finishing it all the way through as you work through it, it's gonna look like multiple people painted that painting. And then uh, secondly, what it enabled me to do was to be able, or free me rather, to be freer with my paint and allowed me to make errors to the point where um, now I make uh, conscious errors with, with my colors that help me enliven the painting. And uh, you can only, only do that by painting all over the painting so that uh, one place you place the color down, you may say, oh, gee, I could, I could actually put this in another corner, or actually, this might work for the color of the person's cheek. And the color may not be exactly perfect, but the uh, paint works perfectly well within the composition, the color composition of the entire painting. And the different colors, the purposefully wrong colors, um, actually give a, uh, an exciting character to the painting. And that's what I learned from Stephanie. Awesome. Something, something to think about. You probably know uh, Neil Welliver's work, you know, the East Coast uh, landscape figure painter. Do you know him? I, I don't. He's a beautiful realist painter. He did a lot of plein air little guy paintings, little paintings and blew them up. And the way he did it was he would grid off the big canvas, start in like one corner, paint each grid and work his way across the image until he got to the furthest corner. And they're beautiful paintings. Ray, I think you've big probably big... Seen, seen it at Crystal Bridges. Crystal Bridges has a really nice Neil Well Welliver. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, I mean, I was taught to paint the same way you were all over. But some people, um, some people don't do that and they still make it look good. Yeah, I had problems with it. And uh, Stephanie really punished me for that. And I didn't quite understand it. Yeah. And uh, I, I kept making these paintings and she kept uh, exhorting me to paint all over the canvas. And I didn't understand until one day she just came and took over my canvas and said, OK, here, I'm going to show you how to do this. And uh, she did a whole underpainting in about four, 45 minutes on a, one of my huge pieces. And then and then I understood. And I, I've been working that way ever since. It's the only way to teach. Well, I'm gonna pop in here and uh, offer thanks. There's uh, several thanks in the uh, in the chat as well. So thanks, thanks to Ray for for being present, of course, and thank you to Leo. I invite all of you to come to the museum and see the exhibition. Pick up a copy of uh, Leo's essay. Um, again, visit our website. It's WindgateMuseum.org. Um, uh, to answer the question in the chat box, yes, there will be a recording. Uh, we've recorded this program and we'll get it up on the website in the next couple of days. So again, that's wingatemuseum.org. Uh, the exhibition is up through March 12th. And I uh, just want to thank you again, Leo. That was 
a fantastic lecture. We're lucky to have had you. Fun. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody, and have a great My night. former na neighbors, Susanna Kelly, Casey I Ramirez. Oh, my God. Old friends and new friends, Leo. It's oh, great. my gosh. And Ava is there. God, I hope I didn't say anything bad, bad or wrong, <laughs> Ava. Oh, my God. <laughs> I think you're good. You're, you were very kind. <laughs> good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.